open source intelligence for military operations abroad under international humanitarian law and international human rights law, Martin Zwanenberg, Chinese Journal of International Law, published the 29th of August, 2024. I introduction. 1. It has long been recognized that intelligence is crucial to planning and conducting military operations. As one commentator states, intelligence is the primary mechanism that military organizations use to generate understanding, and its main purpose is to provide information to decision makers such as commanders that may help illuminate their decision options. 1. 2. Within the intelligence field, various intelligence disciplines have developed, such as human intelligence, signals intelligence and imagery intelligence. Another intelligence discipline is open source intelligence. 2. Although there is much debate on what exactly open source intelligence is and there is not one authoritative definition, there is agreement that open source intelligence is based on publicly available information. 3. With the advent of the internet and the rise of social media, the amount of publicly available information has increased enormously. It has been claimed that open source information makes up about 80% of the material available to the intelligence analyst who is dealing with developments abroad. 3. This, together with the development of new technology and techniques, has revolutionized open source intelligence. Point 4. 4. It is not surprising then that armed forces are increasingly recognizing the importance of open source intelligence for their military operations. Open source intelligence can be used at the strategic, operational and the tactical level. As has been pointed out in the literature, the use of open sources has a number of advantages. These include the fact that it makes it possible to place intelligence that is already available in a broader context, that it is less costly than other intelligence capabilities, that it can be used to compare products from different services, and that it can easily be scaled up and disseminated. 5. 5. Different actors can be involved in the collection and further processing of information in the context of open source intelligence. These include armed forces themselves, intelligence agencies supporting the armed forces, commercial actors and private individuals or groups of individuals. One example of the use of open source intelligence for military operations is the tracking of the location of a command post of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria ISIS by U.S. armed forces. In 2015, an ISIS fighter posted a picture of the command post on social media. Less than 24 hours later, the U.S. Air Force destroyed it. Six another example is the use of social media posts by Ukraine to identify targets in the conflict with Russia. A private company, Molfa, is using open source internet for investigations to identify Russian units based on social media posts. The Ukrainian armed forces then use this intelligence to attack those units. 7. 6. The characteristics of open source intelligence and the environment in which it takes place raise particular questions concerning the legal framework that applies to this type of intelligence. On the one hand, there is increasing recognition that international law applies to intelligence activities. 8. There is no reason to assume that this is any different for open source intelligence. Point 9. Areas of international law that appear to be particularly relevant include international humanitarian law, international humanitarian law, and international human rights law. On the other hand, it is much less clear how the law applies to open source intelligence. For example, do human rights obligations always attach to states when they carry out open source intelligence activities, if and when they do? How does this limit the activities that a state can undertake? And is it possible to derogate from those obligations? The answers to these and other questions are arguably even less clear when open source intelligence is undertaken on social media. 7. The aim of this article is to shed further light on the legal framework that regulates open source intelligence in the context of military operations abroad. In doing so, the article will focus in particular on the two sub-disciplines which were identified as relevant above, that is international humanitarian law and international human rights law. There is a third sub-discipline which also appears relevant, namely data protection law. That sub-discipline will not be discussed in this article because of space constraint. 8. As far as the author is aware, the legal framework applicable to open source intelligence 
used for military operations has so far not yet been addressed in any detail in the literature. There is a body of literature on the application of international law to intelligence activities in general. 10. Also, increasing attention is paid to the use of data in the context of military operations. 11. But the specific issue of the international law that regulates the use of open source intelligence for military operations abroad is still under researched. It is submitted that there is overlap between this discussion and the discussion on the use of data in the context of military operations, as well as of surveillance. The article will draw on literature and case law in those fields. However, there are also issues that are specific to open source intelligence. One of these is the application of the right to privacy to publicly available information. 9. The discussion in this article is limited to the law applicable to open source intelligence in support of military operations abroad. As such, it does not discuss the use of open source intelligence by armed forces in the context of activities within their own state. An example of the latter activity would be law enforcement activities or border control activities conducted by gendarmerie type services of the armed forces. 12. 10. Following this introduction, the article starts by setting out what is open source intelligence and how it is used in support of military operations section 2. It then turns to the application of international humanitarian law to open source intelligence in the context of military operations section 3. The next section, Section IV, addresses the application of international human rights law, specifically the right to privacy. Section V looks at the situation in which both international humanitarian law and international human rights law apply, and how these two regimes interact in such a situation in the context of open source intelligence. The article concludes with a number of final observations, Section 6. Two, what is open source intelligence and how is it used to support military operations? 11. There is much debate in the literature on the nature and definition of open source intelligence. Point 13. It is clear from the literature that there is not one single authoritative definition of the concept. One of the definitions that is often referred to is the one used by the United States Director of National Intelligence, USDNI. This definition describes open source intelligence as intelligence produced from publicly available information that is collected, exploited, and disseminated in a timely manner to an appropriate audience for the purpose of addressing a specific intelligence requirement. Point 14. The definition used in North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, doctrine is broadly similar, stating that open source intelligence is intelligence derived from publicly available information as well as other unclassified information that has limited public distribution or access. 15. 12. These two definitions emphasize the purposeful nature of open source intelligence, in other words that it concerns the collection and further processing of information based on a specific intelligence requirement. 16. It is more than merely collecting information. Another element emphasized by these definitions is open source intelligence as a process. Block states that for something to qualify as open source intelligence, collection and exploitation should show a methodical approach. Point 17. This element distinguishes open source intelligence from the mere collection of publicly available information. The latter is sometimes referred to as open source information, OSIF. As one author states, OSIF is merely unclassified data available to the public while open source intelligence results from applying processing and exploiting the information to validate it as relevant, accurate, and actionable for use by the consumers. Point 18. 13. There is debate on whether or not open source intelligence is a distinct intelligence discipline. 19. For some, the manner of collection plays an important role in this regard, because in open source intelligence information is not collected clandestinely, it would not be an intelligence discipline. 20 others argue that open source intelligence is not a separate intelligence discipline, but rather a facet of each of the other collection disciplines. 21. This perspective shifts the emphasis toward the type of information collected rather than the manner of acquisition, that is clandestinely or not. Point two two for the purposes of this article. Whether open source intelligence is or is not a separate intelligence discipline is not of great importance, because the answer to this question does not affect the application of international law. 14. The essence of open source intelligence is that it is based on open sources. 
Open sources in this context are often referred to more specifically as publicly available sources. This is also the term used in the definition by the USDNI quoted above. Open source information is described as data that can be put together from generic information that is typically widely disseminated. Sources include newspapers, books, broadcasts, and general daily reports. 23 According to the USDNI, OSIF is information that any member of the public can observe, purchase or request, without requiring special legal status or unauthorized access. Point two four. This definition brings information that is available to the public, but only for payment into the definition. Such information includes commercial data sources like satellite imagery services and shipping data. 25. It could also be argued, however, that information which can only be obtained for payment is not truly publicly accessible, especially if the payment involves a substantial fee. 15. Another issue in defining what is publicly available information concerns the use of social media. Millet states that traditionally, information that is shared online was considered public and publicly available. 26. He notes that this view is increasingly contested. Given the scope and sophistication of information gathered from social media websites of detailed personal data, one example would be the case of a Facebook post. A public post by a Facebook user with an open profile would generally be regarded as being publicly available. But what about a post in a Facebook group for international lawyers that requires being accepted into that group and that has limited membership? Some authors take a very broad approach, considering that, where a user verification requirement is in place to access a platform, information on that platform is not publicly available. 27 such cases of what has been referred to as quasi-public content raise difficult questions. 28. 16. Information available on social media is a particular type of publicly available information. Social media has been defined in this context by one author as all online applications that spontaneously and interactively connect internet users through searchable directories, Facebook, LinkedIn, text or audio-based blogs, WordPress, blog talk radio, microblogs, Twitter, Tumblr, video sharing, YouTube, Dailymotion, collaborative tools, Google Docs and Wikis, Twiki, SharePoint.29. 17. Intelligence that is derived from such information is also referred to as social media intelligence. Social media intelligence. There is some debate regarding the question whether social media intelligence is a subset of open source intelligence or whether it is separate. The answer to this question seems to largely depend on the question whether open source intelligence includes intelligence based on information that is privileged that is protected by personal passwords and administrative rights. 30. As this article uses a broad definition of open source intelligence that includes such information. For the purposes of this article, social media intelligence is considered as part of open source intelligence. 18. Because it includes the word intelligence, open source intelligence is easily associated with intelligence agencies. It is also used by many other actors, however, including journalists, police forces and human rights investigators. This article discusses open source intelligence in support of military operations. It will therefore focus on the use of open source intelligence by intelligence agencies and the armed forces, the principal actors involved in supporting military operations. Open source intelligence is used to support military operations in various ways. At the operational level, it can help to understand the capabilities and intentions of the opponent, as well as the effects of the sociological and cultural environment on one's own and adversary operations. In addition, it can assist inter alia in evaluating the effectiveness of operations, support the targeting process, and provide warning indicators for threats in the operational environment. Some concrete examples were already referred to in the introduction to this article. Another example is the use of Google Earth by Palestinian militants to help plan attacks on Israeli military and other targets, 31. The conflict between Ukraine and Russia provides other examples. 32. Open source intelligence has made it possible for the Ukrainian armed forces to track the movements of Russian military units with greater accuracy and to gain insight into plans and operations. 33. Ukrainian forces have been able to use commercial satellite data to track Russian forces.
Several private satellite companies are sharing imagery from their satellites. 34. 3. International Humanitarian Law. 3A International Humanitarian Law and Data. 19. International Humanitarian Law is the legal regime that primarily regulates military operations, including support to such operations, during armed conflict. Consequently, for military operations that take place during an armed conflict, it is a logical first place to look for regulation of open source intelligence. Open source intelligence deals with information, including digital information which is usually referred to as data. This raises the question how international humanitarian law regulates information and data as well as the protection of personal information more specifically, also known as privacy. The answer to this question is that there is a lack of regulation on these issues in international humanitarian law. Point three five international humanitarian law rules generally do not specifically refer to information or data. This is not to say that international humanitarian law does not protect information and data at all. It has been argued that such protection can be derived from particular international humanitarian law rules. 3. B. Medical data. 20. Some of these rules concern medical data. Medical services and infrastructure enjoy specific protection under international humanitarian law. Point three six civilian hospitals, for example, must at all times be respected and protected by the parties to the conflict. 37 commentators have submitted that based on the broad and unqualified scope of such protection, it is generally agreed that such protection includes medical data. 38. This would include patient records, for example. 39. For the purposes of this article, it might be thought that it is unlikely that medical data will be publicly available. However, if publicly available data is seen as encompassing data for purchase, this is not necessarily the case. 40. 3. See targeting and data as an object. 21. International humanitarian law treaties, and in particular additional protocol I, API, contain important rules on targeting. These rules are aimed at the protection of persons on the one hand, and of civilian objects on the other hand. Rules on the protection of civilian objects could provide important protections for digital data, provided that such data is considered to be an object in the international humanitarian law sense. Whether the latter is the case is highly contested. Traditionally, the understanding of objects in the context of international humanitarian law was that this category was limited to tangible, visible artifacts. Consequently, a majority of international humanitarian law scholars argues that digital data does not constitute an object. Point four one Ampere's number of commentators, which is arguably growing, however argue the opposite. 42. Not many states have expressed a view on whether data constitutes an object under international humanitarian law. Those that have, have taken diverging positions. Norway, for example, considers that, I, in the context of target selection, data shall be regarded as objects and may only be attacked directly if they qualify as a lawful target. Point four three France considers that civilian content data may be deemed protected objects. 44 Denmark, on the other hand, states in its military manual that, comma, g, generally speaking, digital data do not in general constitute an object. 45A similar view is taken by Chile. 46. It therefore appears that there is insufficient and insufficiently uniform state practice to conclude that the traditional view that data is not an object is no longer valid. 22. Even if this were to change in the future, it must be recalled that most international humanitarian law rules regulating targeting only apply to attacks. Article 49 API defines attacks as acts of violence against the adversary. Whether in offense or in defense, it is by now broadly accepted that military operations in the cyber domain that cause injury to persons or damage to objects constitute attacks in this sense. 47 But controversy surrounds the issue of whether the notion of attacks should be interpreted more broadly, as also including operations that do not have physical effects. 48 The main question is whether, and if so when, interference that does not cause physical damage but interferes with the functionality of an object constitutes an attack. Point four nine. In the context of open source intelligence, it must be noted that an operation to collect and further process publicly available information would not constitute an attack, even under a broader interpretation of this term. 
This is because such collection and further processing does not affect the functionality of the system on which it is found. Geis and Lahman note in this regard that military activities that leave data intact such as espionage or surveillance operations that are merely directed against the confidentiality of data would not count as an attack in the sense of international humanitarian law.50 This is precisely the case for open source intelligence, which is aimed at collecting data but not altering or deleting it. 51. 23. Such a limitation does not apply to the obligation in Article 57. 1 AP, which requires that in the conduct of military operations, constant care shall be taken to spare the civilian population, civilians, and civilian objects. This obligation applies not only to attacks, but to military operations more generally. Although the term military operations is not defined in API, the ICRC commentary to the protocol states that the term military operations should be understood to mean any movements maneuvers and other activities whatsoever carried out by the armed forces with a view to combat. 52 This would include intelligence gathering, as long as this is undertaken with a view to combat. Arguably, the term need not even be limited to activities with a view to combat, as long as the activities have a nexus with the armed conflict. Indeed, the term military operation does not necessarily encompass only activities with a view to combat. In the military context, it is understood to have a broader meaning. For example, the definition of operation includes the process of combat, but is not limited to activities aimed at combat, a sequence of coordinated actions with a defined purpose. Notes. 1. NATO operations are military. 2. NATO operations contribute to a wider approach including non-military actions. 53. 24. Article 57 API obliges parties to the conflict to spare civilians and civilian objects. This concerns in the first place sparing them from physical harm. It has been argued, however, that the obligation should extend beyond physical harm and apply also to protection of civilians' privacy. According to this argument, in the information age there is a body of individual rights, including the right to privacy, that have a digital manifestation. As military operations are increasingly carried out in the digital domain, these rights should be taken into account. 54. It has also been argued that the duty of constant care should require respecting minimum standards of data protection. 55. Although the text of Article 57 AP, I does not seem to stand in the way of such a broad interpretation, there appears to be very little or no state practices yet to support it. 3. D data is property protected by international humanitarian law. 25. International humanitarian law also contains a number of provisions on the protection of property outside of the context of targeting. For example, Article 23 G of the 1907 Hague Regulations prohibits destroying or seizing the enemy's property unless such destruction or seizure be imperatively demanded by the necessities of war. 56 This raises the question whether information or data in the digital context can constitute property. This question has not been the subject of much study in the international humanitarian law context. The majority of the group of experts that drafted the Tallinn Manual 2.0 was of the view that digital data does not qualify as property. The reasons for this conclusion were similar to those underlying the conclusion that data is not an object. Thus, the majority of experts focused on the tangibility of data for determining whether it can qualify as property. This approach comports with the way in which most domestic legal systems deal with data and property. For example, a Dutch court held in 2023 that under Dutch law, ownership can only be vested in corporeal objects that are subject to human control, Articles 5, 1 and 3 by 2 Dutch Civil Code, and that digital data do not qualify as such. Analogous application of the legal concept of ownership to digital data would be contrary to the closed system of Dutch property law, according to the court, 57, 26. However, there is some support in the literature for recognizing data as property. 58 courts in several states have also started to take a different approach, acknowledging that digital information is property within the context of criminal law and other domestic law regimes. 59 in the specific context of international humanitarian law. States have generally not expressed a view on whether data can constitute property. In view of the strong minority view, 
favoring the treatment of data as property, and the apparent trend in this direction and towards greater recognition of protections for data. Some commentators appear to be willing to accept that data constitutes property, under international humanitarian law.60.27, if it is assumed that data can be seen as property, this raises the question what constitutes seizure of such data for the purposes of international humanitarian law, in particular Article 23, G, of the 1907 Hague Regulations. In general, there is some confusion concerning the meaning of the term seizure in this context. International humanitarian law treaties, including the 1907 Hague Regulations, do not contain a definition of this term. In particular, it is not clarified whether seizure only refers to the practical taking of possession, or whether it also includes the claim to ownership of the property concerned. Duman concludes on the basis of a review of leading authors, that there is no single meaning for the term seizure and requisition, and there is not always a clear distinction between these terms in the laws of armed conflict. 61 For the purposes of this article, a broad definition as put forward by Dinstein will be used. Seizure is a comprehensive term for the taking of any property, for whatever use. Point six two twenty eight. Publicly available information that is collected for the purposes of open source intelligence does not deprive the owner of that information. The information is still available on his or her Facebook page, website, etc. It could be argued that this therefore does not constitute the taking of property because it does not deprive the person concerned of that information. This is not the only possible interpretation, however. More expansive notions are also possible. For a better understanding of this issue, it is necessary to take a closer look at the definition of property. It has been argued that the right to property can be seen as a right of exclusion, or a right of use. 63 Amperes part of the literature places the emphasis on the right of exclusion as the principal, or even so aspect of the right to property. 64 If the emphasis is placed on the right of use, the collection of publicly available information need not violate that right. If the emphasis is placed on exclusion, however, this is different. The right to property framed in terms of exclusion has been defined by Penner as the right to exclude others from things which is grounded by the interest we have in the use of things. 65 on this theory not respecting such exclusion by accessing, or even copying information in the context of open source intelligence, could be said to interfere with the right to property. 29. Such an interpretation finds support in arguments put forward in the debate taking place in the United States, on whether copying of data constitutes seizure for the purposes of the Fourth Amendment. This amendment protects persons from unreasonable searches and seizures of, inter alia, their effects. There is much debate on whether the copying of digital data constitutes a seizure as that term is used in the Fourth Amendment. There is some support in the literature for the position that this is the case. 66. This interpretation is also supported by a judgment of the Supreme Court of Colorado of October, 2023. This court held that, while law enforcement can copy digital data without affecting the owner's access to that data, it is the act of copying that meaningfully interferes with the owner's possessory interest, because it infringes on one's rights to exclude and to control the dissemination and use of that digital data. 67. 30. It may be asked whether such a conception of property, and its consequences can be transposed to the context of international humanitarian law, to the extent that data can constitute property, as is assumed here for the purposes of discussion, International humanitarian law does not seem to preclude this possibility. In their article discussing the conception of property and in international humanitarian law, Brilmer and Chepika argue that property protections in international humanitarian law are not like property protections in other areas of international law and domestic law, which they state privilege ownership and its corollary, the right to exclude. Point six eight. They submit that the conception of property in international humanitarian law is driven by a conception of property that is more instrumental and values property in direct proportion to its role in assuring the survival of civilians. Thus, international humanitarian law distinguishes ownership of property from use of property, largely disregarding the ownership interests that figure centrally in times of peace, but protecting users' interests. 69. 31. This can be read as suggesting that international humanitarian law 
does not reflect an interpretation of property that emphasizes the right of exclusion. Such a conclusion should not be drawn too hastily, however. First, the analysis by Brilmer and Chepiger is based on the four Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols, and not the Hague Regulations. Second, an exclusionary perspective on the right to property does not necessarily ignore users' interests. Indeed, as is clear from the definition of the perspective by Penner cited above, such a right is grounded in the interest persons have in the use of things. 3. E. Article 27 of Geneva Convention IV. 32. Finally, a right to privacy and data protection can arguably be based on Article 27 of Geneva Convention IV. This article provides that protected persons are entitled, in all circumstances, to respect for their persons, their honor, their family rights, their religious convictions and practices, and their manners and customs. It has been suggested that one way a right to privacy can be derived from this article is if the term family rights is interpreted synonymously with the terms privacy, and family or private and family life as used in Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, and Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, ECHR, respectively. 70, however, such an interpretation does not take into account the obvious fact that Article 27 does not contain any reference to privacy. In addition, there does not appear to be any state practice supporting such an interpretation. The obligation to respect the honor of protected persons could also be a pathway to reading a right to privacy and data protection into Article 27.71. The concept of honor is not further defined in the Convention and is capable of encompassing a broad range of rights. There are indications that the term should be understood as including protection from information about a person becoming public. For example, the Law of War Manual of the Netherlands explains that respect for a prisoner of war son includes the prohibition on disclosing strictly personal particulars. 72 Open Source Intelligence, as a form of intelligence, is however not principally aimed at making information that has been found public, and in any event, Information collected in the context of open source intelligence is by definition already publicly available information. 73. 33. Even if a right to privacy and data protection can be derived from Article 27 GCIV, however, such right only accrues to protected persons. The term protected persons is defined in Article 4 GC as those who, at a given moment and in any manner whatsoever, find themselves in case of a conflict or occupation, in the hands of a party to conflict or occupying power of which they are not nationals. 34. It must be underlined that the prevailing interpretation of the expression in the hands of is that this should be understood in a very general sense. It refers not to physically being held by the enemy. Rather, it is sufficient to be in the territory of the enemy, or in occupied territory for a person to be in the hands of the power concerned. 74. This means that persons who are in their own territory that is not occupied are arguably not protected by Article 27 GCIV. 75. 3. F. Sub conclusion. 35. International humanitarian law does not contain any rules that expressly protect information. Arguments can be made that certain international humanitarian law rules can be interpreted to include such protection. Such arguments have been used to conclude that peacetime protection of personal privacy rights do not disappear during armed conflict. 76 However, many of such broader interpretations of existing international humanitarian law rules do not find extensive support in state practice. Even where such interpretations would be accepted, the protection they would provide is limited. For example, because the rule only pertains to attacks or only protects protected persons. IV. International Human Rights Law. IVA the right to privacy. 36. A second legal regime that appears relevant to the use of open source intelligence in support of military operations is international humanitarian law. The information that is collected in the context of open source intelligence will often, although not always, implicate information about particular persons. This potentially brings the right to privacy in play. 37. The right to privacy is set out in a number of human rights instruments, including Article 17 of the ICCPR and Article 8 of the ECHR. It may be noted that different treaties use different terms. 
Whereas the ICCPR refers to privacy, the ECHR uses the expression private life. These terms are however understood to refer to the same right. 77. 38. Although the right to privacy is thus firmly entrenched in international human rights law treaties, there is no agreement on the exact scope and content of the right. Numerous commentators have written on how to understand the concept of a right to privacy, but their views do not provide a clear picture. Neither the ICCPR, nor the ECHR, nor any other treaty contains a definition. 78. The European Court of Human Rights, ECTHR, has held that it does not consider it possible or necessary to attempt an exhaustive definition of the notion of private life. 79. Consequently, there is no consensus on its limitations and what it entails. 80. This is not to say that the right is absolutely unclear. There is a rich jurisprudence of various human rights monitoring bodies and courts that has clarified particular aspects of the right. 39. This case law has demonstrated among other things that there are different aspects, or types, of privacy that each are part of the right to privacy. There is by now general agreement that informational privacy is one of those aspects of the right to privacy. 81. One set of commentators defines informational privacy as typified by the interests in preventing information about one self to be collected and in controlling information about oneself that others have legitimate access to point eight two already in 1988 this aspect was acknowledged by the human rights committee in its general comment on article 17 of the iccpr that general comment states that the gathering and holding of personal information on computers data banks and other devices whether by public authorities or private individuals or bodies, must be regulated by law. Effective measures have to be taken by states to ensure that information concerning a person's private life does not reach the hands of persons who are not authorized by law to receive, process and use it, and is never used for purposes incompatible with the Covenant 83, 40. Since the adoption of this general comment, a large body of case law and commentary has been created around the application of the right to privacy in the digital domain in general, and surveillance tools in particular. This body is also relevant to open source intelligence, which as discussed in section 2 above nowadays mainly takes the form of activities in the digital domain. IVB extraterritorial application of the right to privacy. 41. Before a discussion can be had about how the right to privacy applies to open source intelligence, it first needs to be established that the right to privacy is applicable at all. This depends in the first place on the particular treaties, which contain the right to privacy, that the state concerned is a party to. It is highly likely that a state will be a party to the ICCPR, as a large majority of states are parties to this treaty. All states members of the Council of Europe, CO, are parties to the ECHR. 42. Both the ICCPR and the ECHR contain a provision that defines and limits their scope of application. The ICCPR provides in Article 2 that each state party to the present covenant undertakes to respect and to ensure respect to all individuals within its jurisdiction and subject to its jurisdiction, the rights recognized in the present covenant. 43. The ECHR provides in Article 1 that the high contracting parties shall secure to everyone within their jurisdiction the rights and freedoms defined in this convention, these provisions delimit the geographical scope of application of the treaties. It is generally acknowledged that the principal area where states exercise jurisdiction over persons is their own territory. 84. The starting point for the application of the ECHR and the ICCPR is thus that they apply to persons throughout the territory of the state party concerned. The persons who are the objects of open source intelligence in support of military operations however generally find themselves outside of the territory of the state that is carrying out open source intelligence activities. This raises the question of whether, and if so when, states have obligations under human rights treaties toward persons outside of their territory. This is also referred to as the issue of extraterritorial jurisdiction. 44. Although not unanimous. There is by now broad acceptance in both the practice of states and the pronouncements of courts and human rights monitoring bodies that in certain cases jurisdiction can be exercised outside of the territory of a state. However, 
the exact scope of and basis for such extraterritorial application are contested. 45. Broadly speaking, two main situations in which a state is considered as exercising jurisdiction extraterritorially for the purposes of human rights applicability can be identified. One is the situation in which a state exercises control over a particular geographical area outside of its own territory. This is also referred to as the spatial model of extraterritorial jurisdiction. Under this model, jurisdiction is based on the authority or control a state exercises over a certain space. 85. The state must ensure the full range of human rights under the treaty concerned to all the individuals within the space. 86. The space that is controlled by the state could be part of the territory of another state, such as in the case where a state occupies part of another state, but a state can also exercise control over a smaller space. An example from domestic case law is the judgment in the Mothers of Srebrenica case, in which the Court of Appeals of The Hague held that the Netherlands exercised jurisdiction over the compound of the Dutch contingent in the UN peacekeeping operation in Bosnia for the purposes of application of the ECHR and the ICCPR. 87. 46. The second main situation in which a state is considered to exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction is the case in which a state exercises control over an individual outside of its territory. This is also referred to as the personal model of extraterritorial jurisdiction. This model conceives jurisdiction as the exercise of authority or control by state agents over a specific individual, whose rights may be violated. 88. The clearest manifestation of the personal model of jurisdiction is in cases where state agents exercise physical control over an individual, in particular when persons are detained. It is less clear whether, and if so when, there can be control over an individual without such a physical element. 47. The personal model of jurisdiction is much less limited if it is accepted that control over a person can also take place in a virtual manner. As Milanovic states, if virtual methods can in principle accomplish the exact same result as physical ones, then there seems to be no valid reason to treat them differently and insist on some kind of corporeal intervention. 89. 48. It has been argued that such virtual control should be adopted in the cyber and communications realm to satisfy the requirement of jurisdiction. Such virtual control would exist where a state can remotely control much of the communication of a foreign national abroad. Point nine zero forty nine. This approach has close similarity with what is called a functional model of jurisdiction, so much so that the two models may actually collapse. The functional model concerns situations in which the conduct of a state has direct and reasonably foreseeable effect on human rights. It looks at control over the exercise of rights, rather than control over territory or an individual. This approach has been taken by the Human Rights Committee, HRC, in applying the ICCPR right to life, for example. In its general comment on the right to life, the HRC considered that states have jurisdiction over individuals whose right to life is affected by its military or other activities in a direct and reasonably foreseeable manner. 91 other human rights monitoring bodies have also applied this model of jurisdiction. The ECTHR however appears to have been more reluctant to apply it, although some commentators consider that some judgments, in particular the judgment in Jalad versus the Netherlands, Mark the ECTHR moving away from an approach wherein jurisdiction is founded on the basis of pure factual authority, towards one based on the exercising of authority and control over an individual's rights. 92. The functional model of jurisdiction is often regarded as a third model, separate from an additional to the spatial and personal models. However, it has also sometimes been construed as an aspect of the personal model of jurisdiction, the control over an activity that impacts an individual is then seen as impacting and thereby constituting control over the individual. If the functional model of jurisdiction is applied to open source intelligence, the collection and further processing of public information by a state is seen as affecting the right to privacy of an individual, thus bringing that person within the jurisdiction of that state. 50. There are no pronouncements yet by human rights monitoring bodies concerning open source intelligence and jurisdiction. However, case law concerning surveillance provides interesting points of reference. The Human Rights Committee has stated that a state party should ensure that its surveillance activities, both within and outside its territory, 
conform to its obligations under the covenant, including Article 17, and that any interference with the right to privacy complies with the principles of legality, proportionality and necessity, regardless of the nationality or location of the individuals whose communications are under surveillance, 93, 51. The ECTHR has accepted in several cases that a state carrying out surveillance on its own territory exercised jurisdiction over persons outside of that territory, for the purposes of the right to private life, in Liberty and Others versus United Kingdom, two of the applicants were Irish organisations. 94 The UK did not argue that they were outside the jurisdiction of the UK, nor did the ECTHR raise the issue proprio motu. 52 Similarly, in the case of Big Brother Watch, and others versus the United Kingdom before the Grand Chamber of the ECTHR, the UK did not raise any objection based on jurisdiction, and it did not suggest that the interception of communications was taking place outside the state's territorial jurisdiction. 95 Both the court and the UK therefore apparently accepted that there was such jurisdiction for the purposes of Article 8 ECHR 53. Particularly relevant in this regard is the judgment of the ECTHR in the case of Weider and Guarnieri versus the United Kingdom, which was handed down on the 12th of September, 2023.96. The applicants in this case were two individuals who lived outside the United Kingdom. They complained that their communications might have been intercepted, extracted, filtered, stored, analyzed and disseminated by the United Kingdom intelligence agencies, in violation of Article 8 of the ECHR, the court considered that the principal issue to be addressed in the present case is whether, for the purposes of a complaint under Article 8 of the Convention, persons outside a contracting state fall within its territorial jurisdiction if their electronic communications were, or were at risk of being, intercepted, searched and examined by that state's intelligence agencies operating within its borders, 97, 54. The UK government asserted that the interception of communications by a state party to the ECHR do not fall within that state's jurisdictional competence for the purposes of Article 1 of the Convention when the sender or recipient complaining of a breach of their Article 8 rights was outside the territory of that state. The court rejected this argument. It held that interference with an individual's private life occasioned by the interception, storage, Searching and examination of their electronic communications can be separated from their person. The court essentially looked at the place where effects are produced by the act in question, rather than the place where the alleged victim is present for the purposes of determining whether jurisdiction is exercised. 55. This approach is difficult to reconcile with the text of Article 1 ECHR, which refers to everyone within the jurisdiction of states parties, in other words, to persons rather than effects. As the court pointed out, however, it finds support in other lines of case law. In particular, the ECTHR has previously accepted that the ECHR provides protection under Article 1 of Protocol No. 1, where an individual's possessions are within the territory of the state concerned, but that individual is not. An example is the case of Bosphorus versus Ireland, which concerned the impounding of an aircraft that was leased by a company incorporated in Turkey. 56. Following this line of reasoning, the court stated in Weider and Guarnieri that, similarly, in the specific context of Article 8, it could not seriously be suggested that the search of a person's home within a contracting state would fall outside that state's territorial jurisdiction if the person was abroad when the search took place. 57. The court refers to several previous judgments concerning alleged violations of Article 8, in which the complainant was not present in the respondent state. Applying this to the facts of the case in Weider and Guarnieri, the court states that the interception of communications and the subsequent searching, examination and use of those communications interferes both with the privacy of the sender and or recipient, and with the privacy of the communications themselves. Under the Section 8, 4, regime the interference with the privacy of communications clearly takes place where those communications are intercepted, searched, examined and used, and the resulting injury to the privacy rights of the sender and or recipient will also take place there. 98, 58, the reference to the privacy of the communications themselves is difficult to understand from the perspective of Article 1 ECHR, 
as well as more generally from the perspective of the object and purpose of the convention, that object and purpose is to guarantee respect for the rights of persons, not of concepts such as communications. Article 1 ECHR speaks of everyone within the jurisdiction of a state, which is clearly a reference to persons. The conclusion by the court that interception of communications interferes with the privacy of the sender and or the recipient underlines that those persons do not need to be within the territory of the state concerned. It is not clear how the court sees this from a conceptual standpoint. 59. What is clear however is that the ECTHR answered the question whether persons outside a contracting state fall within its territorial jurisdiction, if their electronic communications were, or were at risk of being, intercepted, searched and examined by the state's intelligence agencies operating within its borders in the positive. In transposing this to the context of open source intelligence, it is difficult to find a reason why the situation would be different where a state collects and further processes public information about an individual who is outside that state's territory. 60. In conclusion, it is likely that human rights monitoring bodies, in particular the HRC and the ECTHR, would find that the collection and further processing of open source intelligence is subject to the limits imposed by the ICCPR and ECHR respectively. This is the case, even if the way in which those two bodies would arrive at that conclusion would be different. The rest of this article will therefore assume that open source intelligence is subject to the strictures of the ICCPR and ECHR, and their right to privacy in particular. IVC does the right to privacy apply to public information? 61. Open source intelligence is based on publicly available information. It is sometimes assumed that because information is public, there is no expectation of privacy, 99 in other words, that the collection and further processing of such information does not constitute an interference in the privacy of persons. 62. There are however strong arguments against the assumption that information that is publicly available is fair game, both from a conceptual point of view and in the case law of human rights monitoring bodies. Edwards and Urquhart note three points that rebut this notion. 100 first, what can be gathered from open source intelligence is not just the obvious substantive content, but also information on the social network of a person for example. Second, information is often not posted by the data subject herself. Consider a Facebook post in which other persons are tagged for example. Third, privacy settings vary across platforms and require vigilance of users to maintain. Other authors put forward similar arguments for the view that publicly available information is not excluded from the protection of the right to privacy. 101. It may be added to this that the line between what is publicly available information and what is not is not always easy to draw, and there may be many cases which are not clear-cut. Against the background of such uncertainty, an approach that presumes that the right to privacy applies could be seen as warranted. 63. That publicly available information does not necessarily fall outside of the protection of privacy is also acknowledged in reports by the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights on the Right to Privacy in the Digital Age. It is underlined in these reports that the protection of the right to privacy also extends to public spaces and information that is publicly available. 102 in particular, systematic surveillance of people in the public space online and offline, in particular when combined with additional ways to analyze and connect the obtained information with other data sources, constitutes an interference with the right to privacy, and can have highly detrimental effects on the enjoyment of other human rights. 103. 64. The notion that publicly available information is not protected by the right to privacy, as such has also been rejected by human rights monitoring bodies. The Human Rights Committee, has rejected the idea that information gathered in public areas is automatically in the public domain and may be freely accessed. In its concluding observations on the seventh periodic report of Columbia in 2016, it stated its concern that in the new police code that was to enter into force all the information and data gathered in public areas are considered to be in the public domain and to be freely accessible. 104. 65. Case law from the ECTHR also supports the idea that publicly available information can be protected by the right to privacy. The leading case is von Hanover versus Germany, 
This case concerned pictures taken of Princess Caroline of Monaco going about her daily life, the publication of which she tried to prevent. The court held that there was no doubt in this case that the publication by various German magazines of photos of the applicant in her daily life, either on her own, or with other people falls within the scope of her private life. Point one zero five. This was so. Despite her being a public figure, the court considered whether the interference with the princess' private life was justified, and found that this was not the case. 66. Other judgments of the ECTHR have similarly found that the right to private life extends to publicly available information. These include Peck versus the United Kingdom, in which the ECTHR held the UK responsible for a violation of the right to private life for failing to prevent the transmission of TV footage of a mentally ill man's failed suicide attempt in a public place. 106. Another example is Antovigan, Mokovic versus Montenegro in which the ECTHR held that video surveillance of professors in university auditoriums must be considered as a considerable intrusion into their private life, and hence an interference within the meaning of Article 8.10767. Cases before the ECTHR have generally, albeit not always, dealt with an infringement of privacy as a result of publication of information. It is less clear if the collection and further processing of such information without its dissemination, is also covered by Article 8.108 in the case of Rotaru versus Romania. The ECTHR dealt with an alleged violation of the applicant's right to respect for his private life on account of the holding and use by the Romanian intelligence service of a file containing personal information. It held that public information can fall within the scope of private life, where it is systematically collected and stored in files held by the authorities, 109. It has been suggested on this basis that the non-systematic processing of publicly available information does not necessarily fall within the scope of the protection of private life. 110. This would imply that the more casual, one, of searches for a person's personal data in open sources need not interfere with the person's right to privacy but more systematic searches will likely meet the threshold of interference. Point one 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 sixty eight. In conclusion, it appears that the fact that information is publicly available does not exclude the possibility that its collection and further processing infringes the right to privacy. The chances that this will be the case are greater if the information is systematically collected and processed. It is submitted that the latter will often be the case if open source intelligence is used in support of military operations. This is because armed forces generally approach intelligence support to military operations in a systematic manner. IVD justification of interference with the right to privacy. 69. As was discussed in section IV above, the right to privacy is set out in different instruments, including in Article 17 of the ICCPR and Article 8 of the ECHR. The wording of these two articles is different with the former prohibiting arbitrary or unlawful interference with privacy, and the latter providing that interference with privacy can only be justified under certain conditions. At first sight, the standards set by both articles could seem quite different. However, based in particular on the case law of the HRC and the ECTHR, a common set of principles can be identified for applying the right to privacy in both articles. Lubin refers to these principles as the principle of legality, the principle of necessity, the principle of proportionality, the principle of adequate safeguards and the principle of access to remedy. 112. These five principles will be taken as the starting point for a discussion of the application of the right to privacy to open source intelligence used for military operations. 70. The principle of legality requires that any interference with the right to privacy must have a basis in law. This requirement has a formal and substantive sense, 113 in the formal sense. There must be an authorization by a rule recognized in the National Legal Order 114. Some states have national legislation that explicitly provides for the collection and further processing of data for the purposes of military operations. Such domestic legislation then provides the necessary basis in law. 71. Where domestic legislation providing a legal basis is lacking, it may be asked whether the international legal basis for the military operation for which the open source intelligence is being used can suffice. 
Such an international legal basis is either a United Nations Security Council resolution adopted under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, or the right of self-defense set out in Article 51 of that Charter. This possibility does not seem to be precluded a priori. Neither Article 17 ICCPR nor Article 8 ECHR requires that a legal basis must be found in domestic law, so that a legal basis in international law is not excluded per se. To the author's knowledge, human rights monitoring bodies have not held that a lawful basis cannot be found in international law. The ECTHR in Weber and Saravia versus Germany stated that the term law within the meaning of the convention refers back to national law, including rules of public international law applicable in the state concerned. Point 115 note however that this statement by the ECTHR can be read as implying a distinction between states with a monist and states with a dualist legal system. In the former, a UN Security Council resolution will likely be applicable in the sense that it is regarded to be part of domestic law automatically. In the latter case, it could be argued that such a resolution is not applicable in the state concerned without being transposed into domestic law. This would then still leave open the question whether such a resolution may constitute a legal basis without the mediation of domestic law. 72. Authorizations by the UN Security Council usually take the form of an authorization to use all necessary means. This expression is generally understood to include the use of force, but it also encompasses less far-reaching measures. The latter category includes the collection and further processing of publicly available information. It may be noted that this discussion concerns the question whether a UNSC resolution may constitute a law in the sense of Article 17 ICCPR and Article 8 ECHR. This is a question that deals with application of those rights. It is different from the question whether the Security Council can deviate from human rights. The latter question falls outside the scope of this article. 116. 73. Self-defense is an exception to the prohibition on the use of interstate force but also serves as a circumstance precluding wrongfulness in the law of state responsibility. As such, it can arguably also serve as a legal basis as required for a lawful interference with the right to privacy, as long as such interference was necessary and proportionate to repel an armed attack. This presumes that a circumstance precluding wrongfulness, in other words a justification for conduct that would otherwise breach international law, can be seen as a law in the sense of the right to privacy. Again, it is emphasized that such an invocation of the right to self-defense is in the context of the application of human rights, not in the context of setting them aside. It is recognized that measures taken in self-defense must respect human rights unless and to the extent that they can be derogated from under the treaty concerned. 11774. The principle of legality not only requires that there is a law regulating interference with privacy, but also includes a number of substantive requirements that the law must meet. In particular, it must be publicly accessible, clear, precise, comprehensive, and non-discriminatory. Point 118 with regard to the requirement that the law is accessible. This means that the person concerned must be able to have an indication that is adequate in the circumstances of the legal rules applicable to a given case. Normally speaking, this requirement is satisfied through the publication of the relevant legislation. In the case of domestic legislation, this is nowadays generally available on the internet. This is certainly also the case for UNSC resolutions. It is less clear how this requirement would be met in the case of self-defense. States are required under Article 51 of the UN Charter to immediately inform the UNSC of measures taken in self-defense. This is normally done through a letter addressed by the state concerned to the president of the UNSC. But states do not always inform the UNSC. 119 The letters sent by states are available online in the UN document system. But even for trained international lawyers it is sometimes difficult to locate them. 75. With regard to the requirement that the law must be clear and precise. This means in alia that relevant legislation must specify in detail the precise circumstances in which such interferences may be permitted. 120 The ECTHR has held in this regard that the level of precision required of domestic legislation, which cannot in any case provide for every eventuality, depends to a considerable degree on the content of the instrument in question, the field it is designed to cover and the number and status of those to whom it is addressed. 121. 76. 
UNSC resolutions and the right of self-defense will generally not meet this requirement, as they do not set out precisely under which circumstances interference with privacy is permitted. 77. The principle of necessity requires that the privacy-intruding measure employed must be necessary to achieve a legitimate aim. The ECTHR has held that the requirement of necessity must be interpreted narrowly, and that the need for restrictions must be convincingly argued in a given case. 122. 78. The third principle is the principle of proportionality. This requires that the interference with privacy must be proportional to the end sought. 123. In other words, it must not exceed the limits of what is appropriate to achieve its legitimate objectives. 124. This requires a balancing between the interests of the state concerned and the right to respect for privacy of person regarding whom open source intelligence is collected and processed. Proportionality must be assessed based on the circumstances of each individual case. 125 Ampere's number of relevant aspects of proportionality can be derived from the case law of the ECTHR. One is that the amount of data that is collected and stored should be as limited as possible. 126 The data should only be used for the purpose for which it was collected. 127 data should not be kept for longer than is necessary for the purposes for which it has been collected. 128. 79. The fourth principle is the principle of adequate safeguards. 129. This principle refers to a number of important procedural requirements for the prevention of abuse. In the context of processing of data, it includes a procedure to be followed for examining using and storing the data obtained. It also includes having a system of supervision in place. The e. enjoyment of the right to privacy depends largely on a legal, regulatory and institutional framework that provides for adequate safeguards, including effective oversight mechanisms. Point one three zero. The ECTHR held in Roman Zakharov versus Russia that it is to determine whether the procedures for supervising the ordering and implementation of the restrictive measures are such as to keep the interference to what is necessary in a democratic society. Point 131. The supervision should normally be carried out by the judiciary. However, in the context of secret surveillance, human rights monitoring bodies have recognized that supervision by non-judicial authorities can be sufficient, provided that they are independent of the authorities carrying out the surveillance and are vested with sufficient powers and competence to exercise effective and continuous control. 132 It is submitted that this also applies to the collection and processing of information in the context of open source intelligence for the purpose of military operations, which can be seen as a form of secret surveillance, or at least to share many of its characteristics. 80 The fifth and final principle is the principle of access to a remedy. 133. This entails an obligation for states to ensure that affected persons have proper access to effective remedies in cases of abuse. Point 134. This obligation will often, but not always, entail an obligation to inform affected persons of the measures taken. Human rights monitoring bodies have held in the context of secret surveillance that the purpose of that surveillance may make notification undesirable, at least for some time. In 2007 the ECTHR considered that in this context that as soon as notification can be made without jeopardizing the purpose of the surveillance after its termination, information should be provided to the persons concerned. 135 however, it has also acknowledged that notification is not necessary if the system of domestic remedies permits any person who suspects that his or her communications are being or have been intercepted to apply to the courts. 136 These considerations for not requiring immediate notification the court had in mind also apply to open source intelligence for the purpose of military operations. It is submitted. IVE derogation. 81. It is important to point out that human rights treaties provide for the possibility to derogate from human rights obligations under certain conditions. This possibility is provided for under Article 4 of the ICCPR and Article 15 of the ECHR. A derogation is a temporary suspension of certain human rights or aspects of human rights during a state of emergency. 137 Both treaties exclude a number of rights from those which may be derogated from. These non-derogable rights do not include the right to privacy however. Consequently, 
it is in principle possible to derogate from this right, but only under the conditions provided for by the treaties. These conditions are strict. The ICCPR requires that for derogation there be a time of public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation, and the existence of which is officially proclaimed. This is a high threshold. The HRC, for example, has criticized states for derogating from the ICCPR, including from its Article 17, in situations which do not necessarily meet this threshold, 138, it must be noted that there is some debate on the extent to which derogation is possible in respect of extraterritorial military operations, in particular in respect to peace operations from which it can withdraw, 139 without going into the details of this debate, it is submitted that the better view is that wherever jurisdiction extends territorially, so should the possibility to derogate, 14082. Furthermore, a state may only derogate to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. This requirement relates to the duration, geographical coverage and material scope of the state of emergency, and any measures of derogation resorted to because of the emergency. 141 measures taken by states on the basis of the derogation must also be not inconsistent with their other obligations under international law and not involve discrimination solely on the ground of race, color, sex, language, religion or social origin. This means in alia that such measures be in accordance with international humanitarian law, where applicable, 142, 83. The ECHR contains similar requirements for derogation in Article 15. Derogating widens the possibilities for a state to carry out open source intelligence without violating the right to privacy. It is however subject to strict requirements and, as such, does not provide a carte blanche to states. IVF sub-conclusion, 84. On the basis of the above, it may be concluded that the right to privacy is laid down in the ICCPR, and the ECHR potentially limits the possibilities for the lawful conduct of open source intelligence in support of military operations, even if the persons who are the subject of such activities are outside of the state concerned. It is likely that human rights monitoring bodies will find that collecting and further processing publicly available information concerning them is subject to the limits imposed by the ICCPR and ECHR respectively. The fact that information is publicly available does not in and of itself exclude the possibility that its collection and further processing infringes the right to privacy. The chances that this will be the case are greater if the information is systematically collected and processed. For such an infringement to be lawful, it must be in accordance with the principle of legality, the principle of necessity, the principle of proportionality, the principle of adequate safeguards and the principle of access to remedy. It may be noted that the discussion above of how these principles apply to open source intelligence was mainly based on pronouncements by the HRC and the ECTHR. It is acknowledged that not all details of the interpretation of the ECHR by the ECTHR may carry over into the interpretation of the ICCPR. However, it is submitted that the core five principles identified above apply to states parties to both treaties. Furthermore, even for the few states that are not parties to the ICCPR, limitations are imposed by the right to privacy under customary international law. 143. The interaction between international humanitarian law and international human rights law in the context of open source intelligence. 85. The previous sections of this article have demonstrated that the use of open source intelligence for military operations in the context of an armed conflict is regulated by international humanitarian law as well as international human rights law, specifically the right to privacy. International humanitarian law only applies during an armed conflict and only to activities that have an access to the armed conflict. Consequently, if open source intelligence is undertaken in support of a military operation that is not part of an armed conflict, international humanitarian law will not apply. 86. In many cases, however, open source intelligence will be used in support of military operations that are part of an armed conflict. The examples given in the introduction of this article concerning the military operation against ISIS in Iraq and Syria and the military operation by Ukraine against Russia are cases in point. In such cases, 
The question arises how international humanitarian law and international human rights law interact. 87. One possible approach to the interaction between international humanitarian law and international human rights law is that during an armed conflict, international humanitarian law displaces the application of international human rights law. On this view, the right to privacy under international human rights law has no role to play during an armed conflict. Such an approach currently does not enjoy much support in the international community. 144. It has been rejected by the International Court of Justice in its wall advisory opinion, in which the court held that the protection offered by human rights conventions does not cease in case of armed conflict, save through the effect of provisions for derogation of the kind to be found in Article 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 145 human rights monitoring bodies have also held consistently that in principle, human rights continue to apply during a situation of armed conflict. The Human Rights Committee has stated that both spheres of law are complementary, not exclusive in its general comment on the right to life. 146 The ECTHR, inspired by the ICJ, has also found that in principle the ECHR continues to apply during armed conflict. 147, 88, in principle, because the ECTHR has also found that the ECHR does not apply during an active phase of hostilities during international armed conflict, at least in regard to certain human rights, in its judgment in Georgia versus Russia, too, the court held that Russia did not exercise jurisdiction in the sense of Article 1 ECHR during an active phase of hostilities in the armed conflict between Russia and Georgia. In 2008, it held that the very reality of armed confrontation and fighting between enemy military forces seeking to establish control over an area in a context of chaos not only means that there is no effective control over an area as indicated above but also excludes any form of state agent authority and control over individuals. 148, 89. Consequently, the court concluded that Russia did not exercise jurisdiction over persons during this active phase of hostilities in respect to the substantive right to life. However, it did find jurisdiction to exist in respect of the detention and treatment of civilians and prisoners of war, even during this phase. Accordingly, as the court stated in its admissibility decision in Ukraine and the Netherlands versus Russia, the Georgia versus Russia, too, judgment cannot, therefore, be seen as authority for excluding entirely from a state's Article 1 jurisdiction, a specific temporal phase of an international armed conflict. 90. What then is the precise scope of the exclusion of application of ECTHR rights during an active phase of hostilities remains ambiguous? and subject to further clarification in future ECTHR case law. One thing that is clear is that this exclusion is concerned with the applicability rationa personae of the ECHR, and not its applicability rationa materiae. In other words, it is not based on an argument that international humanitarian law displaces the application of the ECHR, as the ECTHR held in Ukraine and the Netherlands versus Russia, even in situations of international armed conflict, the safeguards under the convention continue to apply. 149. 91. If international humanitarian law and international human rights law both apply during armed conflict, then the question arises how they interact. A starting point in this regard is the holding by the ICJ, in its wall advisory opinion that, as regards the relationship between international humanitarian law and human rights law, there are thus three possible situations. Some rights may be exclusively matters of international humanitarian law. Others may be exclusively matters of human rights law. Yet others may be matters of both these branches of international law. 150. 92. In the first two situations described by the ICJ, there is no problem in applying the rule of international humanitarian law and the rule of international human rights law, respectively. In the third situation, both rules can be applied concurrently, unless there is a conflict between the applicable rule of international humanitarian law and of international human rights law. Different tools for the resolution of such conflict have been proposed, 151 in particular, 
The maxim of lex specialis derogat legi generali has been put forward as a tool to resolve norm conflict. According to this maxim, the more specific legal rule takes precedence over the more general rule. I have written elsewhere on factors that can aid in determining whether a rule is the more specific one. 152. 93. It has been suggested that because international humanitarian law is more often than not silent on issues concerning privacy, there will rarely be conflicts between international human rights law and international humanitarian law when it comes to information, and that consequently, it will be possible to simply transplant the right to privacy into a situation of armed conflict. 153. This, it is submitted, must be nuanced. It has been convincingly argued that in addition to situations in which there is a clear conflict between a specific rule of international humanitarian law and a specific rule of international human rights law, there are also cases in which there is competition between norms from the two regimes. 154 in such cases, rules of international humanitarian law and international human rights law do not conflict in the sense that they led to contrary or contradictory opposing results, but their application nevertheless results in normative tension. This is primarily the case where international human rights law regulates a situation, and where international humanitarian law is silent, but where the rationale of international humanitarian law pulls in a different direction, it has been proposed that in such a situation, it is not a matter of simply applying the rule of international human rights law, but that in the application of international human rights law the principles of international humanitarian law must be taken into account. 155. 6. Conclusion. 94. This article aimed to shed further light on the legal framework that regulates open source intelligence in the context of military operations abroad. It has focused in particular on how international humanitarian law and the right to privacy under international human rights law regulate such activities. It was found that there is conceptual debate surrounding open source intelligence concerning its definition and whether it extends to information that is protected by passwords for example. This notwithstanding, it became clear that the essence of open source intelligence is that it is based on publicly available information. 95. When open source intelligence is used in support of military operations that are part of an armed conflict, international humanitarian law applies. International humanitarian law however does not contain any rules that expressly protect information. Arguments can be made that certain international humanitarian law rules can be interpreted to include such protection, of which perhaps the strongest is based on the obligation in AP, I for parties to an armed conflict to take constant care to spare the civilian population and individual civilians. 156 however, some of these rules apply only during international armed conflicts, excluding their applicability during non-international armed conflicts which constitute the majority of today's conflicts. This article has focused on discussing the rules applicable in international armed conflicts. In addition, broader interpretations of existing international humanitarian law rules to ensure they encompass information do not, or at least not yet, find extensive support in state practice. Even where such interpretations are accepted, the protection they would provide is limited. 96. In view of the limitations of international humanitarian law with regard to information, the right to privacy and in international human rights law provides a more promising avenue for providing guidance on open source intelligence in support of military operations. This regime comes with its own ambiguities however. One of these concerns whether persons who reside outside of a state enjoy human rights protections when that state undertakes open source intelligence activities which affect them. It was found that based on the case law of the HRC and ECTHR, it is likely that they will answer this question affirmatively. Another difficult conceptual issue is whether the fact that information is publicly available excludes it from the right to privacy. It was found that although there is a measure of uncertainty surrounding this question, human rights monitoring bodies will probably find that it is not excluded, at least not if the information is systematically collected and processed. 97. For an infringement on the right to privacy to be lawful, it was found that five principles must be applied. These were identified as the principle of legality, the principle of necessity, the principle of proportionality, 
the principle of adequate safeguards and the principle of access to remedy. These five principles raise questions of their own when applied to open source intelligence in support of military operations, which require further clarification, such as whether a UN Security Council resolution can constitute the legal basis for such activities. It was concluded that states have the option to derogate from the human right to privacy and thereby limit the scope of their obligations, including in the context of military operations. However, this is subject to strict requirements. 98. The final part of the article discussed the interaction between international humanitarian law and the right to privacy in situations of concurrent application. It was found that in such a situation, they both continue to apply. The human right to privacy is not displaced by the mere application of international humanitarian law. However, the ECTHR may limit the application of parts of the ECHR during an active phase of hostilities. The precise scope of this exception identified by the ECTHR remains to be clarified. In situations where the application of the right to privacy is not excluded, it can be applied to open source intelligence together with relevant rules of international humanitarian law. It was submitted that where these two conflict, the maxim of Lex Specialis can serve as a tool for resolving that conflict, and that in situations of non-competition, the principles of international humanitarian law should be taken into account. 99. Overall, it appears that international humanitarian law, and especially the human right to privacy, are capable of providing guidance on open source intelligence in support of military operations but that this guidance is subject to many uncertainties that call for further clarification. The article did not discuss the use of open source intelligence by armed forces in the context of activities within their own state. However, no elements were identified in the discussion above that would imply that other conclusions would apply to the use of open source intelligence by armed forces in that context, apart from the fact that it will be easier to conclude that human rights apply. 100. Various actors could contribute to the clarification that is called for in various ways in which this could be done. First, states could decide to negotiate a new legal instrument. Such an instrument could either focus on open source intelligence specifically, or the use of personal data by armed forces more generally. It could focus specifically on situations of armed conflict, or on the use of data by armed forces also outside the context of an armed conflict. Adopting a new instrument would have the advantage of allowing for drawing up rules specifically intended to clarify issues that are now ambiguous. Another advantage would be that such an instrument would be legally enforceable between states. It is however unlikely that broad agreement could be reached on a legally binding instrument in the international community on these issues. This is due at least in part to different approaches to the protection of data by different states as well as to the general state of international relations which has left less room for multilateralism. 101. Second, human rights monitoring bodies could clarify different aspects of the right to privacy as it pertains to the protection of information in general, as well as specifically in the context of military operations. Such clarification could be the result of case law of those bodies. A disadvantage of this method is that this relies on applications being brought by victims that allow or even require those bodies to address particular issues. In addition, in their case law human rights monitoring bodies tend to focus on the specific set of facts at issue in a particular case, which may make it difficult to draw more general guidelines from such case law. A less fragmented approach could consist of the HRC updating general comment 16 on the right to privacy. Such an update could provide explicit articulation of what is the right to privacy of communications in the digital sphere, and spell out the content of this right to ensure its effective protection and enforcement. Point 157, 102. Third, authoritative guidance could be provided on the interpretation of existing rules of international humanitarian law in the context of the information domain. Unlike in the field of international human rights law, there are no monitoring bodies such as the HRC or ECTHR specifically devoted to monitoring compliance with international humanitarian law. However, the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, is generally seen as having authority where the interpretation of international humanitarian law is concerned. 
Of particular interest in this regard is the project being carried out by the ICRC to update the commentaries on the four Geneva Conventions. Updated commentaries to the first three Geneva Conventions have been published in recent years. These take into account the collection and use of information, including through digital means. In the context of a number of articles, the updated commentary to the fourth Geneva Convention is expected to be published shortly. This commentary could provide guidance on the interpretation of Article 27 GCIV, discussed above in Section 3, E103. Finally, states themselves can contribute a clarification. One way in which they could sow this is by placing their interpretation of international humanitarian law rules and of the right to privacy in the context of military operations on record. One avenue for doing so is to include this issue in their military manuals. Another way in which states could contribute to clarification is by putting in place national guidance for such activities and being as transparent as possible about such guidance. 158 such national practice can then also be taken into account by international bodies interpreting the international humanitarian law and international human rights law rules. The author is Professor of Military Law at the University of Amsterdam and the Netherlands Defense Academy. He is grateful to Asaf Lubin, Sebastian in Regions, Peter De Word and Ferry Cox for comments on an earlier version of this article. Any remaining errors are the responsibility of the author. Copyright the author, S. 2024. Published by Oxford University Press. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse distribution and reproduction in any medium provided the original work is properly cited